Welcome, fellow soldiers of the gaming realm, to a video game that plunges deep into the heart of Metal Gear Solid's most cryptic enigmas and fan-fueled mysteries. In this exploration, we transcend the virtual battlefield and dive headfirst into the realm of conspiracy theories and fan speculations that have shrouded the iconic series in an aura of intrigue. From the elusive Patriots to the mind-bending plot twist, join us on a journey where the fan theories collide with the enigmatic story and narrative of Metal Gear Solid. Get ready for a mission unlike any other, as we unravel the web of conspiracies that fans have spun around Hideo Kojima's masterpiece. This is Metal Gear Solid, unraveling the conspiracy theories. Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear Solid franchise is one of the most iconic in gaming, and within it, Quiet remains one of the most controversial characters, as Stephanie Houston would take the role of Quiet. Quiet is a character in Metal Gear Solid 5 who helps Big Boss. She can make herself invisible, she is mute, though she likes humming, she also appears incredibly revealing without no clothing. At the time of MGS 5's release, the character drew controversy, and many argued that her muteness by extreme critics was misogynistic, and by such critics, who probably no doubt have their ties within liberal LGBT mindsets, consider Quiet to be massively over-sexualized. With such ludicrous controversies that don't back any of their claims by fact, Juice then is aware of the controversy that surrounds the character, as she claims she still respects the choices Kinjima made and his team designing in the character. She argues that she sees video games as a fantasy world, so it's no surprise that you'll find a character that's visually appealing. This doesn't mean that she doesn't sympathize with the opposing viewpoint. She states people are looking for more representation, and I really get it. If there's one thing for clear is that some people overlook Kojima's work. One isn't simply trying to sexually objectify women, nor are they trying to exploit them for their female characteristics, but instead trying to empower them by advertising the beauty of what a female has to offer. During September 7, 2013, a few days after the initial release of Phantom Pain, in a series of tweets, Kojima said he directed MGS5's art director to make some of the game's characters, including Quiet, more erotic. In an effort to encourage cosplay and promoting figurine sales, he has since clarified these tweets, saying, sexy was the better word to use. In quote, what I'm trying to do is create unique characters. One of those is, of course, Quiet. She's really a unique character, and I wanted to add that sexiness to her. End quote. Many have argued this topic on Quiet about whether Kojima's questionable stance on really what his intentions were for Quiet. But really, it might be a lot more simple as it seems, as we do know that throughout the Metal Gear franchise, there is many eccentric characters, and they're not void without strong female characters that play a big emphasis within the game. One director called David Ellis, who's the designer of Halo, took the issue with the deception of Quiet calling the character design, quote, disgusting and that's evidence that the game industry is full of man-babies. Within my personal response, seems like an overly aggressive, saturated comment directing towards men who appreciate female beauty. Clearly an unintellectual response that's trying to shame men for liking what's natural. There is many that will agree on my stance that throughout movies and games, there is plenty of attractive women, and one in those names is James Bond. The problem is with these extreme critics surrounding the controversy of Quiet, is they seem to not understand the deeper meaning of really what Quiet's story brings to Metal Gear Solid V, and the importance with the parasites and the overhaul story that Quiet plays a massive part in. Sure, there's scenes and moments within the game that makes people question whether there's something deeper than it really is such as Quiet being locked in a cage during Mother Base, where she can escape easily at any time. But when you understand the story and the reason for why she's kept in there, it makes it quite clearly evident that they're not just trying to be misogynistic. Hideo Kojima would quote, and I quote, I know there's people concerning about Quiet, but don't worry, he wrote in a series of messages. I created her as a character, and an atheist to the women characters appeared in the past fighting game who are excessively exposed. 
quiet who doesn't have a word will be teasing the story as well. But once you recognize the secret reason for her exposure, you will feel ashamed of your words and deeds." End quote. We can see within the hospital scene of Metal Gear Solid 5 that initially Quiet was fully clothed, so it's not a sexual objectification of what is trying to be presented here. I think that Kojima's work was definitely misread and overlooked by widely broad liberal-minded conspiracy theorists. At this point in the game we can understand why exactly it is that Quiet does become naked in a sense. She is infected with the parasites and she needs those parasites in order to live. But by doing so, she has to breathe for her skin, which means why she has to wear revealing clothing. For the extreme conspiracy theories that honestly believe that Kojima is a misogynist extremist who hates women. Whereas within the simplicity of it is the fact that he's trying to show that women can both be sexually appealing at the same time as being well gifted within skills and talents that really present just much more than their very appearance. As I believe, and as more many of you do, that Quiet was so much more than just a piece of eye candy. The brilliance of Quiet's appearance is the very fact that it's the noticeable thing that you see within the screen. It only just adds to the more intrigue of really knowing more that she's just a pretty face. That behind all of this is a woman that has got a deep, moving, powerful story of immensely great superhuman abilities that really tie in with the whole aspect of the parasites within Metal Gear Solid V. The problem that we have today with the political spectrum that is people take things in the wrong way. Evidently clear that Kojima's work was taken massively out of context. As Kojima had already provided the explanation behind Quiet's character, the controversy should have died there and with it. But of course people would still continue to believe that this was simply trying to exploit and objectify females. Throughout many games and movies, there has been a diverse range of female protagonists. Some argue within these communities, female characters have consistently been relocated to secondary roles in gaming. Whilst yes, exploitation and objectification happens within movies and video games, Metal Gear Solid just isn't one of those games. We're not talking about a Hollywood flick, we're talking about a well-drawn-out story that is so much more deeper than a character's appearance. Problematic situation is that these people don't have the intellect enough to look far and beyond what makes his character so wonderful, and the very fact that they become over-obsessed with the very problem that they've created. In essence, Quiet Story stands out not just for its initial visual impression, but for the depth, emotion, and unexpected beauty that unfolds as players progress through the game. It showcases the narrative complexity and the thematic richness that Hideo Kojima often infuses into his games. The relationship between Quiet and Venom is unexpected and emotionally charged. Their connection evolves beyond words, relying on shared experiences, gestures, and a mutual understanding that transcends traditional communication. Ultimately, the interpretation of character design and its impact on the gaming community is subjective, and different players may have varying opinions on the matter. Whether Quiet is perceived as over-sexualized or not, it's clear that her character possesses depth and a compelling story that goes beyond her initial appearances. Some players appreciate the context provided for Quiet's design and see it a part of the game's narrative and thematic elements, whilst many others may still find it challenging to separate the context from the visual presentation. Each female character is unique depending on what the genre of what the game or movie has to offer. As I explained with genres and topics within movies, some discuss the terrible things that happen, such as Metal Gear Solid 5, that explores and covers many themes within the topics of war, with the absolute atrocities that get committed and how it impacts us as the viewer to demonstrate real-world events. With Metal Gear Solid's story being so in-depth, it's so easily to get immersed within Quiet's character other than just the way that she appears to be. Quiet isn't the objectification, she is the exclamation. She's the very thing that captures your attention in a loud, broad concept of really what her character brings to the table. This is one of the biggest controversies within Metal Gear Solid, one that quite respectively, both different communities are going to have their own different takes on what they believe Kojima's intention was behind the arrival of Quiet. One either way is very interesting to discuss, as it's been years since its initial release, still holds up today as being quite a controversial topic. I chose the language. 
language of gratitude instead and go back to silence. I am quiet. I am the absence of words. It's like an actual UFO! I knew it! Those Yankees are working with the aliens! By far one of the most controversial and very overseen characters is Chico. Yes, his love of Bigfoot and all things mythological such as UFOs, which we will dive into the topic. But first I want to get into the fan theories that stemmed all a long time ago, which the theory circulating around the fact that Chico had transitioned into a woman and turned into quiet. Bear in mind, this theory came from Reddit, so yeah, no surprise there. But according to a post on Reddit, it was officially confirmed that Quiet is not Chico. I think it was obvious from the most of us that from the get, Chico definitely wasn't Quiet. Whilst they do share similarities such as green eyes and same hair color, evidence points towards the fact that it isn't possible. Chico is not from the same origin as Quiet, they both speak different languages, and that pretty much wraps up the whole entire conspiracy. Chico was initially going to be making his way into the Phantom Pain just after Ground Zero, but of course like a lot of things in Phantom Pain would eventually get scrapped. We knew this because there was conceptual art that got released of Chico's unused assets, which explained to us that of course he possibly couldn't be quiet because he was going to be his own character within the game. Sadly, it's not another part of the story that opened up on the lore of Metal Gear in which we love so much that Chico wore the red coat, just like Paz did within Peace Walker. It would have been interesting to see how he would have been driven by revenge too, considering his needs was just as great as the likes of all the rest of MSF and Diamond Dogs. We could all imagine with inside the open world of Phantom Pain that one would have come across Chico and perhaps had a bit of a battle with him, Chico feeling confused and attacking Big Boss out of anger only to come to the realization that of course his goals are to destroy Skullface just like Big Boss. But Chico not being present within the Phantom Pain really does add to the tragic side of his story and the dangers of war, being a revolutionary and joining Big Boss's outfit to succumb to death within the helicopter. There's no doubt that his role plays a pivotal part into the storytelling of what Chico has to offer by helping Big Boss recover the likes of Paz and giving him the intel that he needs. In fact, it's thanks to Chico that Big Boss still remained alive. By his keen sense of intuition and his understanding of intel gathering, which is definitely rubbed off on him from Big Boss in the outfit at MSF, Chico's character serves as a symbol of the darker side of conflicts, highlighting the exploitation of children in war zones. This game uses Chico's story to address ethical and moral dilemmas associated with warfare providing players with a thought-provoking experience. Sadly, Chico wouldn't make it through, but we did learn that Chico was a big fan of giant conspiracies such as UFOs and Bigfoot. One more thing. When you get to the force, be on the lookout for Bigfoot. I... I... think I'll be okay there. <laughs> Bigfoot is an ape man that lives in the Rocky Mountains. In the local Indian language, he's known as Sasquatch. And get this. He's over three vada. Can you believe that? So he's kind of like a gorilla. Completely different. Even the biggest gorillas only get to about two vada, and they walk on their knuckles. Bigfoot's big, and he walks on two feet like people. Chico is a fan of cryptozoology, and hilariously, he thinks that the Metal Gears during the time in Peace Walker are aliens. But of course, Bigfoot refers to the legendary and elusive creature said to inhabit various wilderness areas, particularly in the forests of North America, also known as Sasquatch. Reports of Bigfoot sightings have been circulating for centuries, with many accounts, footprints, and blurry photographs claimed as evidence. Despite numerous reported sightings, Bigfoot has never been conclusively captured or photographed. Its elusive nature adds to the mystery surrounding its existence. While many people believe in the existence of Bigfoot, others are skeptical and attribute reported sightings to hoaxes, misidentifications of known animals, or a combination of natural phenomena. Despite the popularity of Bigfoot's legend, there is no scientifically accepted evidence confirming the creature's existence. The search for Bigfoot continues to be a topic of interest for enthusiasts, researchers, and skeptics alike, with ongoing debates about the validity of reported sightings and the credibility of evidence presented over the years. 
It's possible that there was a Bigfoot creature that survived over several years ago, because according to scientific reports, there was at least eight other human species that existed alongside Homo sapiens, some of whom extended for far longer than we have. The 15 types of human species discovered till the date include Homo gigantogenius, the Homo habilisus, the Homo erigaster, the Homo erectus, and the Homo rufadolphinus. We Homo sapiens didn't used to be alone. Long ago, though, of course, there was a lot more human diversity. And now, over 300,000 years ago since then, it appears that these other human kinds have been extinct. The interesting notion of this is that researchers also suspect there are many other fossilized species yet to be excavated. So it is very possible that Bigfoot did exist. Whether he exists today or not, well, that hasn't been proven. But if one thing makes sense, we know why the Bigfoots got eliminated, thanks to John Marston during 1911 killing them all off. So thanks to this lovely outlaw, there is no such things as Bigfoot anymore. Sorry, guys. This is ridiculous. Apparently, UFOs are connected to cattle mutilations. Cattle mutations? No, 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 no. Not mutations. Mutilations. It's a word I'd never heard before. People have been reporting their livestock dying in mysterious ways near the same places where UFOs have been sighted. They say the bodies are drained of blood and the eyeballs and sexual organs are gouged out. Wow, well, when you leave a corpse cut open in a field somewhere, the ground soaks up the blood. Yeah, but supposedly these cows weren't cut up by any man-made means. The phenomenon of the cattle mutilations has been associated with UFOs, unidentified flying objects, sightings and unidentified aerial phenomena leading to speculation and conspiracy theories. Cattle mutilations typically involve the discovery of dead cattle under mysterious circumstances, often with specific surgical-like cuts and the absence of blood. Precise surgical incisions and reported cases of cattle mutilations is that the animals are often found with precise, clean surgical incisions. These cuts may include the removal of specific organs such as the udder, rectum, eyes, and tongue. One notable aspect is the apparent lack of blood around the carcass. Considering the surgical nature of the cuts, this has led to speculation about the potential use of advanced technology. Some individuals who claim to have witnessed UFO sightings or encounters also report seeing unusual lights or objects in the vicinity of areas where cattle mutilations occur. The link between UFOs and cattle mutilations is often based on the unexplained nature of the phenomena, the simultaneous occurrence of these events. Some theories propose that extraterrestrial beings or UFOs are involved in cattle mutilations, conducting experiments or studies on Earth's animal life. Some, of course, is natural causes, and the predation of skeptics urge that many cattle mutilations can be attributed to the natural causes, such as scavengers or predators. They suggest that the precise cuts may be a result from post-mortem process of scavenging behavior. Human activities is one theory, that people propose that human activities including secret government experiments or covert operations may be responsible for some instances of cattle mutilations. Do bear in mind that there has been many reports of this phenomena several centuries ago, reporting exactly the same thing. Also, that it's noted that this phenomena usually takes place quite a lot within South America, probably in the same region from where Chico's from. The most strangest things about this phenomena is that anybody who's been near these mutilations of a Geiger counter detected unnormal amounts of radiation. This is a mystery that is yet to be unfolded. UFOs kidnap people too. You know, alien abductions. You've heard of the heel abduction, right? That couple back in the 60s? So when I first saw the Colibri, I thought it was a UFO. Ah, the Fulton recovery. I know those guys are working with the aliens, even if they wouldn't let me see them. Well, you better not get caught again, or they'll be experimenting on you. <laughs> the Hill Abduction, also known as the Betty and Barney Hill Abduction, is one of the most famous and widely discussed alleged UFO abductions cases in history. It involves an American couple, Betty and Barney Hill, who claimed to have been abducted by extraterrestrial beings in September 1961. The incident gained public attention and became a landmark case in the case study of UFOs and alleged alien encounters. In the night of the abductions on September 19-20, 1961, Betty and Barney Hill were driving through the White Mountains of New Hampshire on their way home to Portsmouth after a vacation in Canada. They observed the strange light in the sky that seemed to be following them. The couple reported seeing a structured craft with flashing lights and they claimed it was descending towards them, causing them to stop their car. 
Betty and Barney Hill also reported experiencing a period of missing time during the encounter. They could not account for about two hours of their journey. Under hypnosis, the couple separately re-encountered a detailed narrative of being taken aboard a craft by humanoid beings who performed medical examinations on them. Betty described the beings as short, with grey skin, large eyes, and no hair. These descriptions have become somewhat iconic in the UFO lore, and have influenced the popular image of extraterrestrial beings. Hills actually sought the help of a psychiatrist, Dr. Benjamin Simon, who used hypnosis to recover memories of the alleged abduction. Their accounts under hypnosis were consistent and detailed, contributing to the credibility of their story in the eyes of some investigators. The case received widespread publicity and the Hills became known figures in the UFO research. The Betty and Barney Hill abduction played a role in popularizing the concept of UFO abductions and influenced subsequent reports of similar encounters. The Betty and Barney Hill case remains controversial. Similar reports just like theirs still continue to this day. What do you think they look like? Completely bald maybe with, with gray skin and big black eyes? Or maybe they're four vara tall and wear skirts? I kind of doubt it. I'll give you one thing though. I've never seen anything move like that. Oh, maybe the CIA really did make contact. You see? It's true! Brilliance of Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker within these tapes is it demonstrates the adoring characteristics of Chico and his appreciation for conspiracy theories. If any of you haven't played Peace Walker, I highly suggest that you do, and if you have, go back and listen to some of these tapes that Chico talks about, because aside from the ones that I've mentioned, he mentions many more than myths and legends and cryptozoology that can definitely keep you intrigued. When it comes to conspiracies and controversies, it doesn't get any more controversial than Chico. Look! They played us like a damn fiddle! Uh, look boss, I owe you an apology. Hear me out, okay? <sighs> sure. I, uh, knew Paz and the Professor. I knew who they really were all along. Cause... I used them. I suppose you were the one that brought them to Columbia in the first place, huh? Guilty as charged. All of you may be aware there was a conspiracy going around that Kasahira Miller was actually working alongside Skullface. Being a former member of Cypher himself, it's a good possibility that Kasahira Miller would have met with Skullface since they was both part of the same organization. Do bear in mind what I'm talking about is based on theory and speculation. During the events of Peace Walker, it is most certain that Kaz had no idea what the true intentions of what Paz had been appointed to by Zero to make MSF a part of Cypher's Strike Force, a military organization. Beginning, both Big Boss and Kaz were enemies until Kaz eventually decided to join the cause of Big Boss's vision and eventually becoming his right-hand man and the commander of MSF. Ironically, the very organization that Big Boss is fighting, Cypher, Zero would be the reason behind the funding of MSF and the very expansion of its military equipment and mother base itself. With Kaz giving us this revelation of him actually working alongside Cypher to expand MSF, it only would cause the reason why Big Boss and Kaz would have their separation in the end. As naturally, Big Boss would distrust Kaz for not being honest with him at the very beginning, and also the fact that he has his ties within Cypher, the very organization that Big Boss clearly wants to destroy. There will be no one to oppose them. For the first time, the world will be ruled by a single will. Until the new order is in place, you and your army will be the force that protects it. You will be Cypher's deterrent, pulling the wool over the ice of the old order with your charisma and military prowess. The intentions of Cypher were definitely made clear, as Paz explained, as Zero's unhealthy fascination with Big Boss would be the very reason for why he'd want to control him for a means of using spies in order to infiltrate Big Boss's outfit to gather all the things he needs to make Big Boss be his military commander in his world stage takeover. But with the controversy surrounding Kaz and his involvement with Skullface only gets more interesting towards the events of Ground Zero. Ten days ago, we got reports that Paz was still alive. She survived. She was rescued by a Belizean fisherman who found her drifting in the Caribbean. So what's the plan? Silence her before we're compromised? No. I've got something else in mind. Who knows what they're doing to Chico and Paz? I'd like to interrogate her ourselves. But if worse comes to worst, make sure she's dead. Chico, on the other hand, we have to bring back. Fast. He knows too much about us. Our friends at Cypher suspect Paz could be a double agent. She's being held for interrogation at a camp on the southern tip of Cuba. Black fat. Nice. A slice of American eye on communist soil. 
and out of U.S. legal jurisdiction. The upcoming inspection of Money Base has to be connected somehow. The timing is too perfect. During the events of Ground Zeroes is where the controversy surrounding Kaz becomes really prevalent. XOF, as led by Skullface, is portrayed as a covert, deadly force that operates in the shadows. He has his ties in with Cypher as well, and was actually appointed by Zero to be the commander of XOF. Although, through different means of ideologies and beliefs, he become to revere and hate the likes of Zero, wishing to destroy Zero himself and along with Cypher. And no doubt wanting to destroy Big Boss, who he knows is a part of Cypher's outfit too. He is aware that Big Boss is a thorn in his side, and by eliminating Big Boss is one problem out of his way for his bigger schemes, for, the, for his own personal motives, and for what he believes to be the boss's true will. If one thing that Skullface has in common with Kaz and Big Boss is the very fact that they want to destroy the same organization. And with Paz being captured, knowing so much information about Cypher, what better way to extract information out of her to try and find out the location of Zero? There are orders delivered by proxy. Except you. You met with him, face to face, in order to contact Big Boss. Uh. Tell me where he is. Where is Cypher? Alright. Zero is... Hell's Kitchen. Tenth Avenue. We're aware that Big Boss is trying to combat Cypher, and in doing so has his own nuclear weapon, with Metal Gear Solid Zeke being underneath the ocean floor of Mother Base. One can't forget the level of power that Zero wields in his possession. The very fact that he also controls the likes of the United States Congress and a lot of the global orders within the United States. Of course, being one of the very biggest nations in the world. And then the Major came to me with an idea. Washington doesn't know how to spend money, he said. I'd like to redirect it. His goal was an organization dedicated solely, covertly, to supporting America. Cypher. Skullface being one of Cypher's closest allies at the time, Zero was unaware of the fact that he would turn, and in doing so, through theory and speculation, would have understood that this inspection was most likely sent by Zero, and by getting this information, he would capitalize on this to destroy Mother Base. But unbeknownst to Big Boss and his outfit would have no idea really what the true inspection and the nature of it was, was actually really just a ruse sent by Cypher, in which Skullface would learn of this information and capitalize on. But realistically, it's more likely that he got the information out of Paz, and Kaz really isn't the suspect, nor Huey. Thanks to your report, a nuclear inspection team's being sent to their base. The scientist was our way in. It all ends soon, exactly as I've planned. All thanks to you, Big Boss or Cypher. You can only save one. Boss, can you hear me? What's up, Huey? Our guests are right on time. Document destruction and hangar decontamination are complete. AFVs have been stowed away. And Zeke's on the seafloor along with a nuke. Everyone's got their story straight. The guided tour will be wrapped up by the time you get home. Make me proud. By the time they leave, I'll have the IAEA praising us as the poster boys for world peace. The whole events of Ground Zeroes and the Phantom Pain are shrouded within mystery because there's so many things that contradict one another with each character's motives and interest. But one thing in particular that makes Ground Zero so interesting has to be the tapes. The very tapes that tell us all the information regarding all the controversy. And one of those tapes in particular is Kaz's involvement with Skullface for what one only can assume is to extract information out of past to find out where Cypher's location is. Kill this shot already! Kill this shot already! Kill this shot already! The whole intriguing thing behind this very conspiracy is the fact that Kazuhiro Miller, aside from him being an ex member of Cypher, is also the fact that within the cassette tape, we quite clearly hear his voice, which within the actual Japanese and English version is the same actors who play as Kazuhiro Miller. And theory circulating around the conspiracy is that Kazuhiro Miller's intentions was to destroy Big Boss himself and that he never really left Cypher and he was always on Cypher's side as a triple agent, as a spy. This is nothing concrete, but because the line is spoken by both Kaz English and Japanese voice actor, 
we can believe that it is completely intentional. We can't assume it's a random XOF soldier, because why would it matter that they use the same VA for one specific character across two languages for one specific line? We have to assume that it is Kaz or was working with Skullface at some point. Of course this isn't being confirmed by official sources, but one can assume that the voice actors perhaps may be just reused in order to play one of the XOF soldiers. But one thing that is questionably bizarre is that both the English and Japanese voice actors are the ones who are playing as Kaz. Very much seems like this is much of a coincidence, but perhaps maybe it's not as deep as we think it is, and perhaps these actors are just playing as an asset to the XOF soldier. As I mentioned at the start of this controversy surrounding Kaz, it only comes very more intriguing towards the events of Phantom Pain, during the time that Big Boss was still supposedly with inside the hospital, awaking from his coma. And with the events just after Ground Zeroes after the fall of Mother Base, where Big Boss's body would be extracted by Cypher and put at a secret military hospital in Dekelia in Cyprus, where Kaz would have no idea where Big Boss's body was kept. Yes, it's me. You weren't in hospital long. I had trouble finding you. Where is he? Safe but in the same state as when you last saw him. We've had our misunderstandings, you and I, but as you've made clear, our relationship is strictly business. Therefore, I will limit this conversation to the business at hand. Please understand that I don't dislike you, not inherently. Where is Snake? And to be honest, I was entirely comfortable leaving matters in your hands. Don't take it the wrong way. Anyone looking for him would be looking for you. He needed to be as far from you as possible. In fact, I'm still not sharing his location, even now. The only reason we're having this conversation is because you still have a role to play. Within the tape between Kaz and Zero, we can clearly see that Zero has a great deal of mistrust for Kaz, not telling him where the real big boss's location is, which ties into the theory that Kaz's distrust and betrayals is the reason why Zero doesn't feel confident in allowing Kaz to know exactly where the real big boss is being kept, and instead Robber entrusting Ocelot with such matters, who would play his role in the parts of directing and guiding the Phantom to take the stage of being the new big boss. Of course, that being Venom Snake. With Zero's plans in motion, Venom Snake would be nothing more than a pawn in a larger game, to take down ex-member Skullface, who was a threat to the very organization known as Cypher. Kaz being aware that Big Boss is alive would also understand the role that he'd have to play in order to assist Venom Snake within his mission, which is confirmed by a tape at the very end of the game, which has many fans speculating that Kazuhiro Miller was more than aware of Venom Snake's identity just after he was rescued and taken to Mother Base, and this information was confirmed to him by Ocelot. Explain why Kazuhiro Miller was so distant and cold and very aggressive within the Phantom Pain because he knew the truth. Of course, he'd feel massively betrayed by this move, in which where he admitted he wants to destroy Big Boss by taking Big Boss's sons and Venom extracts revenge on him. But bear in mind, it wasn't Big Boss's fault for the disasters that took place. It seems evidently clear that Kaz always wanted to settle a score with Big Boss because he always had his allegiances with Cypher. A very organization that would later then be under control of an AI and other forces, the United States that would see Big Boss as a threat. Of course, at the time, Zero would have done anything to rescue Big Boss, as he always considered him a friend, even though he was also an enemy. Hence the saying that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Big Boss is building a nation. But until it's complete, we support the other Big Boss. The Phantom carries on his legend, his meme. That is Big Boss's plan. So that's the way it is. Big Boss can go to hell. I'll make the Phantom and his son stronger to send him there. For that, I'll keep playing my role. If the day ever comes that you go back to Cypher, I'll aid the other son. And then you and I will be enemies too. One of us will have to kill the other. And another telling revelation about Kaz's involvement with Skullface is on one of the tapes between Zero and Skullface himself is the very fact before the events of Phantom Pain, Kazuhiro Miller was in Operation Round Rhodesia, 
No doubt for plans to excavate certain nematodes and different viruses for biological resources and information for Cypher. That's why some fans speculate that's why Kazuhiro Miller is infected with the parasites. Given on the evidence we can hear of the tapes, it sounds like Kazuhiro Miller was working alongside Skullface in order to extract this information about biological resources, which eventually become the very thing that would be known as the Fox Dye program that could target specific individuals. Given on the evidence on the tape I'm about to show you, it seems like Skullface had the superiority over Kaz, in a sense he had the jurisdiction over telling Kaz what he should do. Goldface's true intentions was to eliminate everybody in Cypher, including Kaz. Goldface would be the reason behind the deterioration of Zero, and also why Kaz was missing his limbs and was partially blind. It's about our man, Major. He's been making some moves. Miller? Yes, I know. Rhodesia, is it? Yes, and up to his old tricks again. No matter. He'll stumble soon enough. Hmm. Although, he is under my jurisdiction now. It's clear that Zero appointed Skullface to be one of his main fundamental commanders in Cypher, giving him a more position of power than the likes of Kaz, who he didn't trust as much because he understood that his intentions were to eventually eliminate him. However, he wasn't none the wiser to know that Skullface would turn on him. Skullface keeping the cards close to his chest, not showing any signs of betrayal that would give Zero the impression Skullface and XOF would be a threat to the organization. At least of the events prior before Phantom Pain. You see Venom Snake rescue Kaz, we can see that he is massively reserved and doesn't explain the reason behind his lost limbs and his partial blindness, which opens up to the interpretation he didn't want to tell Venom Snake or Big Boss that he was working with the enemy, which is Skullface, which would outright make him a complete traitor. Quite clearly demonstrated as we can see that Kaz says, you have no more use for me, and not elaborating further on who was behind his damages. Of course, deep down inside he probably knows, but in the tapes he isn't too sure who was behind his interrogation, as he tells Venom Snake that his memory is clouded after being attacked by the misunit, unit that is closely tied to Skullface's organization. It's that Zero informed Miller at some point of his deteriorating condition, and then had changed plans to stop working for Skullface and support Venom Snake, and in doing so, of course, Skullface would see that as an act of betrayal, and then of course would want to eliminate Kaz at least making an impression out of him by removing his limbs and making him partially blind. In theory, Kaz was no more used to Skullface. Once Skullface would realize that Kaz was no longer useful, naturally he would discard him, which would only further explain Kaz's animosity towards Skullface and wanting to seek revenge more than anybody else back at Mother Base. Whatever happened to me, I lost consciousness before I knew it. When I came to, I was in a Soviet camp tied to an interrogation chair. Could they be some new Spetsnaz unit? No. The ones that interrogated me were just the average rank and file. Whatever group attacked us, the way they moved was just insane. And that mist, appearing out of nowhere. The Soviets don't have tech like that. If they did, Ocelot would have heard about it. I doubt the West does either. Otherwise, the folks at Langley would be sleeping a lot easier. Why'd they come after you? Wish I knew. I'm the only one who survived. Though I don't think they planned it that way. God. No more use for me, huh? Gus, it's me. I'm here to get you out. Snake. They do something to your eyes? No, it's... It's just bright as all. What's very bizarre and unusual about these conspiracy theories is they might not really be too far from the truth. Given on all the points of evidence and things we can piece together, not just me, but the MGS community included, have really found a case for why potentially Kazuhira Miller could also be infected with the parasites. But like I say, bear in mind this is only just theory. But can you notice something very unusual about these three characters, Co-Talker, Kaz, and Zero? They both have been infected by the parasites, that of course being Co-Talker and Zero, as we already know. But one thing that you can particularly see within these photos is that all of them have the same resemblance with their eyes, which is a clear indication of somebody who's been infected by a particular side of the parasites. To be more specific, a certain strain of parasites. As we're all aware, there are several strains within the game that affect different languages. And not just that, with certain parasites giving people superhuman abilities, such as the skulls and Quiet herself. And if this is the case, then this is a clear indication that Kazuhiro Miller was definitely working alongside Skullface 
and zero within the research of parasites and biological research. In The Phantom Pain, Co-Talker is a Navajo elder and a parasitologist, and he has the ability to actually communicate with the parasites, which also makes the next thing I'm about to demonstrate more interesting to why cars could be infected with a parasite strain. Interestingly, Co-Talker's logistic abilities extend to a unique form of communication with these parasites. He can control them and command in them, leveraging their capabilities for various purposes. Do bear in mind that Co-Talker refers to the parasites as his children. One of the scenes of the Phantom Pain that goes massively overlooked is a scene with Co-Talker explaining the eyes of Kazuhira Miller. Even with Skullface dead, our brothers are unavenged, and the phantom pain he brought us lives on. Cypher is still out there. We know that planet spies, parasites among us. You will be my eye. The consensus level of morale is shrouded by conspiracy and uncertainty within the faction that is Mother Base. Most of the characters, one or another, have worked alongside Cypher and Skullface. Aside from Venom Snake, of course, who was oblivious to the fact at the time that he was actually not Big Boss. You can see the level of hypocrisy that Kazuhira Miller is trying to self-preservate and protect his own image. For the very fact that he himself is a hypocrite, as he clearly mentions several times within the game that how much he hates and distrusts Cypher, but yet he's a very part of Cypher himself. As the viewer, we can sense the level of uneasiness and distrust between the unit within Diamond Docks and the characters themselves. So cozy around here these days, huh? Yeah. Every chance they get, they're telling us not to trust anyone. Commander Miller's gone a little cuckoo ever since that Skullface guy died. All that phantom pain talk. I'd say all he's fighting is phantoms. Well, revenge was his only reason for getting up in the morning. Then he got his revenge. And it didn't bring back anything he lost. Now he's left with his rage he doesn't know what to do with. Yeah. We both know that Kojima and Konami had creative differences. For one that we don't actually know if this was meant to be intended that Kaz really was to be a traitor, and if the story would have been expanded on as we already know that it was meant to be. Or if the facts are that really it is just left open for interpretation for us to decide in what we believe, but no doubt it's a very breathtaking conspiracy. What if she's a spy? What if I'm a spy? You. Go on all day. Boss. Let her go. She won't speak so she can't spread the infection. Miller was in contact with Cypher nine years ago. He was working with them. He's the traitor snake! Ocelot's statement on Kaz going back to Cypher would come to fruition. In a sense, he did betray Big Boss, because he followed the very ideals of which the Patriot's plans was, and at the time, Solid Sneak was oblivious to the fact that he was nothing more than a Patriot pawn to do the bidding of taking Big Boss out under the direct orders from those who was working with the Patriots to protect their very own establishment that wanted to enslave the planet. Because the question that we have to ask, if Kaz was really on Big Boss's side, why wouldn't he follow him through his events of Outer Heaven and Zanzibar to assist him to defeat the Patriots, which only just makes it more clear that perhaps Kaz's intentions was really never to help Big Boss at all. And in the tragic story of Venom Snake, a soldier so highly loyal to his unit, who went out of his own way to protect Diamond Dogs at all cost, it even put his own life at risk, all just to do the right thing. 
Venom Snake really did have the best of intentions, but would be caught up within this messy affair surrounded by conspiracy, lies, and deceit, and having his identity taken from him would sadly put his trust in those who he thought he had a connection with, but really were just using him for their own advantages and gain. And that's why, as the conspiracy theories go, that Kazuhiro Miller was just doing the same, using Venom in a means of way to grow his own power and to be able to get his revenge against Skullface for all the terrible things that have happened to him. This is something that has been highly speculated throughout the MGS community. It's quite widely known. It's probably one of the most profound conspiracies within the Metal Gear Solid lore, that actually, whilst it may be considered a conspiracy, it honestly might not really be too far from what the truth is. The research facility Emmerich was talking about is north of the Soviet base. That's where Skullface is keeping Sahelanthropus before setting it loose in Afghanistan. There's a good chance he's got nukes too. Boss, we need to figure out what Skullface is up to. If you make contact with him, get him to talk. The ethnic cleansing parasites, Sohalanthropus. Find out what his plans are. OKV0 is a location in Metal Gear Solid 5, shrouded in mystery and intrigue that gives a great deal of attention to the MGS fans that still leave people scratching their heads regarding the true nature of what this lab or silo is really all about. With speculations of the unusual green mist that hovers over the night skies of Afghanistan, which some come to believe is due to the parasite testing with those big noticeable tubes infecting the water supply of the region. And to add to some sources, state that Salampropis was originally meant to be located at OKB0, but cut from the game. OKB facilities are typically associated with research, development, and manufacturing. Paranormal and supernatural occurrences in Metal Gear Solid V's narrative, the game explores themes related to advanced technology, genetic manipulation, and mind control, contributing to the otherworldly atmosphere. In short, it's not just a military outpost, but a central hub connected to the game's overarching plot, with ties to Skullface's plans and the player's quest for revenge. OKB Zero's design includes deceptive elements such as hidden passages and unconventional layouts. The facility challenges players to navigate its complex structure and uncover its secret. The organization Cypher, led by Major Zero, is a central antagonist in the Metal Gear series. Some conspiracies speculate that OKB Zero is a key location for Cypher's hidden agenda possibly involving the manipulation of geopolitical events to control information. And most noticeably, the most strange thing that people seem to point out is the appearance of the Diamond Dog logos on the infrastructure in OKB0, and the ambiguous theories of Diamond Dog's involvement of using OKB0 as a processing facility for materials for Mother Base, or someone is secretly supplying resources to Skullface, and vice versa. Some speculated it was very unusual that Kaz would insist on risking Venom Snake's safety by following Skullface around and learning his plan, instead of bombarding Skullface with helicopters and DD soldiers at the heliport. XOF is well manned, but so is Diamond Dogs at this point. Hell, they even have more backup than usual in certain situations. The theories also point to the fact that Psychomantis, who has the ability to control people's thoughts and in a sense possessing them, is the very reason why the conflict didn't happen between XOF and Diamond Dogs, and was trying to gauge really who had the lust for revenge all that much more, because at the time, as we know, Psycho Mantis was motivated by those who wanted to claim revenge, such as Skullface or Volgin, or even Venom Snake himself, hence why he keeps switching allegiances. And it's actually these emotions such as revenge and anger that act as a conduit for, to power Psycho Mantis' psychokinesis abilities. With his supernatural abilities, has the power to manipulate the environment around him, hence why Venom Snake perhaps saw the Diamond Dog logos if they're not just a reused asset. And that the symbol is a duality to show that both Skullface and Venom Snake do share a common goal, and that is to destroy Cypher, and they're both driven by revenge almost like if they're both allies in a metaphorical sense. Or could it really just be that Venom Snake hasn't taken his anti-psychotic hallucination medication, hence why he sees the logos? According to the report, the third boy was easily influenced by other individuals' biofields. Evil thoughts, in particular. They affected his mind like a virus. Extreme anger or resentment, motives for revenge, in other words. 
Roy began to physically parasitize individuals experiencing extreme anger and codify the host's desires. This includes amplifying the host's natural strengths. Or, in accordance with the host's desires, he can also implant program code in another individual, making them a puppet, essentially. The emotions he picks up from another individual are amplified and unleashed into his body as they recur in his brain. They turn into microwaves, which then affect the physical world, triggering paranormal phenomena like the spontaneous combustion of organic matter or psychokinesis, you know, moving an object without touching. There's one other thing. While he's parasitizing a host, the boy's ego gets shut away, allowing the will of the host to take control of his powers, like some annoying static drowning out your own voice. That means he isn't responsible for what's been happening. Somebody's extreme anger has manifested through the third boy's powers in ways none of us could have predicted. Everything was powered by anger, malice, revenge. I guess the anger emanating from you was something he could truly relate to. Furthermore, there's an interesting theory that looks deeper within the true nature behind OKB0, with claims that with Huey being the lead designer of Salanthropus, that why is it within the interrogation he admits that it's being held at OKB0? We clearly know that it's being held at Sorak Power Plants. OKB0! Salanthropus is beyond the Soviet base camp! In a lab built by the Soviet philosophers! That's what you're looking for. All things are shrouded in heavily supernatural mystery. Given on his statements, at some point, it must have been that Salanthropus was actually held within OKB0. Within the context, he is so certain that it should be there, which ties in with a more deeper conspiracy that goes further down the very rabbit hole. Considering the Salanthropus is practically a mobile and not designed for a human pilot, how could it be possible to transport it unnoticed? But this is where the theory really becomes fascinating that the big giant hole surrounded by tubes was actually a transportation point that leads to an underground tunnel that connects to the Serac power plant. Hence, Salanthropus' appearance there is supposedly meant to be confirmed by chatter of Soviet soldiers, according to some sources. First see the appearance of the Salanthropus in the Serac power plant. Inside the power plant appears to be a giant hangar suitable for the transportation of Metal Gear that appears to be on a moving platform with wheels. When we put the pieces of evidence together and Huey's statement, it's very possible that Salanthropus can be transported back and from OKB0 back to the power plant, OKB serving as a relay point in order to do some experimental testing with different supplies and materials, uranium and metallic archaea and the parasites, big tubes at OKB0 serving as a conduit to be able to connect this to the Metal Gear, enhancing its abilities as we see out there in the field. This is where it really gets interesting. As we know, Skullface did no longer have to worry about how he was going to pilot Metal Gear, as he had Psycho Mantis on his side to do it for him. And in doing so, it wouldn't make sense it actually been with inside OKB0, since there was no further use of testing and the Salanthropus containing all the armament in it needs to be ready and active. Of course, that's what Skullface meant most likely when he said to Big Boss, I will show you my demon. Referring to the fact that he had found another way to pilot the Metal Gear through the means of using Psycho Mantis. That's why I'll show you my demon. Follow me, big boss. Huey Embrick's statement and him sounding confused really is a genuine take for why he believed that Salamphrophis should still have been at OKB0. Naturally, he couldn't understand how it's possible that Skullface managed to get this Metal Gear to work and make it active without his support and assistance since he was working alongside Big Boss. Snake, do you read me? I know more than anyone about OKB0 and Salamphrophis. Still all quiet at the silo. No sign of Skullface or his Goliath. Surely they can't already have... No, never mind. Something's wrong. But it has to be here. In the deeper controversy of the development of Metal Gear Solid V, we realize that Kojima and Konami had creative differences, such as Konami's shift in their business focus, development delays, and budget overruns, would really probably suggest for why OKB0 seemed quite unfinished like a lot of the things within Phantom Pain. Bear in mind whilst we see through the perspective of other characters, we mostly see through the eye of Venom Snake, which another plausible explanation for seeing things that naturally don't make sense 
whatever one can speculate that the one thing once we find again in Phantom Pain is that the notion of our interpretation is clearly challenged, but with each speculation only makes theories and statements counter each other's arguments, leaving a definitive answer into a stalemate. If one thing is clear, we do know that Venom Snake's hallucination is a big reason behind a lot of the things that we see within OKB0 and on towards the power plant, as some of the XOF soldiers seem to have green bands on the back of their helmet, only for them just to change in the next scene to turn blue. Before he ever walked or cried, even before he was born, his mother... This theory is a couple of years old now, and people still talk about it today. It's evidently interesting to try and discuss the true nature of behind the intentions of the characters in Metal Gear Solid 5, because naturally within MGS5, a lot of things are left open for interpretation. Or it's just plainly simple that a lot of things in the Phantom Pain are just plainly unfinished. Sadly, some things may never be confirmed, given on the departure of Kojima and the creative differences between Konami and Kojima as a whole. One thing isn't a theory, is that Metal Gear Solid 5 left as a beautifully polished, unfinished story. With data miners finding nothing conclusive, this is a mystery that still remains open. We're taking on some very heavy subjects, such as race and revenge. This makes the tone much darker. Who, who is that That third character that we're seeing from his perspective at the beginning? Is that, that a new character or someone that we know from the Metal Gear universe? Oh, I don't know who this. That's actually me. Do you consider the Phantom Pain and Big Boss's story, do you, do you feel like this game is going to sort of fill in the gaps between Big Boss's story and Solid Snake's story? Is it sort of completing kind of the loop? Please don't look at me in the eyes because I'm so tempted to tell you and I shouldn't, I really shouldn't. Kojima is a, is a brilliant man and he never does anything without it being groundbreaking. I've said it many times, but I understand why people feel Snake is cool and admire him. In reality though, Snake is and always has been nothing more than an extension of the player. He's your alter ego. Now do you remember who you are, what you were meant to do? Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain was released on September the 1st in 2015. Nearly eight years since its initial release still has the fans connected and asking plenty of questions about this beloved title. Directed by Hideo Kojima, this game had a significant impact on the gaming industry for several reasons, and the character known at the time as Venom Snake played a central role in the game's controversies to who exactly this very new protagonist was who he was playing as. The narrative of The Phantom Pain is known for its complexity, mature themes, and layered storytelling. The game explores topics such as consequences of war, the blurred lines between good and evil, and the manipulation of individuals by larger powers. One of the major controversies in The Phantom Pain revolves around the revelation that the player controlled the character, initially believed to be Big Boss. The series' iconic protagonist is actually Venom Snake. This twist was met with mixed reactions as it reshaped the understanding of the game's narrative and the player's role in a larger Metal Gear Solid saga. As many are aware, Venom Snake's character is a result of a medical procedure in order to make him look like the real big boss. He would undergo facial reconstruction and hypnotherapy to act as a decoy. Some players found this twist unexpected and felt that it significantly altered the perception of the Metal Gear Solid lore. And at the time, everybody who picked up this game when its first initial release had no idea that we was playing as somebody else. Which left many fans speculating and really trying to contemplate exactly who is it we was meant to be playing as. Considering that all signs were pointing to the fact that we wasn't playing as a legendary hero Big Boss, some people would figure this out quite early within the game. And also a great majority of people like myself who had doublethink and believed in a lie, feeling deep down inside with our gut feelings that something wasn't right, and that there couldn't be a possibility that we're playing as somebody else other than the legendary hero Big Boss. We was evidently in denial, as we couldn't honestly think of not playing as anybody else but the legend himself. But truth be told, we all knew really that the writing was on the wall. Go. Let the come back. 
interesting side of this controversy dates back two years before the release of Phantom Pain. Back when everybody really was trying to break down the trailer to try to figure out if exactly who is his protagonist were playing as, as there was many clues and reasons to guess that really we was playing as a decoy or a stand-in for the real big boss. This theory gained a lot of strength as fans analyzed the trailers and the promotional material, noticing discrepancies in the facial features and the voice acting that didn't align with the previous portrayals of Big Boss. And one particular YouTuber that is quite renowned and has quite a lot of followings within the MGS community in terms of analyzing Metal Gear Solid content and lore and breaking footage down, with some bizarre claims and theories that he had, with all due credit where it's deserved, he wasn't really too far from the truth, Whilst the speculations really don't match with the timeline, of course some of the speculations that he made about the body double theory and we're not playing his big boss would evidently become true. Hideo Kojima is known for his pen charts for misdirection and playing with the audience expectations. Some fans believe that the director intentionally released misleading information to keep the true identity of the protagonist a secret until the game's release. Anybody who's a true connoisseur or anyone who really takes in the lore of Metal Gear Solid realizes that the direction of these games is shrouded within a great deal of mystery because most Metal Gear Solid games can't be taken face value as we have to read between the lines, look at the writing on the wall and see the bigger picture. Kojima's writing is ambiguous and like a fine wine that many of us enjoy. One of these speculators that was quite renowned as I mentioned is Python Selken who had the theory that perhaps the new protagonist could potentially be Grey Fox. Ethan Selkin's video received a great deal of attention at the time, as everybody wanted to speculate what the trailer was and was desperate to know the answers for the truth. Of course, there was plenty of people within the Metal Gear Solid community that would strongly disagree with his theories that Grey Fox is the new big boss, which would be called outright blasphemous. One thing is for certain, Python Selkin did have a point on the body double theory, there's no question about it. But when it comes to the characteristics of the people such as Yang Ye and Python Selken, I think they share something very similar in common. It's been in love with their content so much that in fact they become so stuck up their own ass. In a sense, they love the smell of their own farts. This isn't me trying to throw shade on the likes of Python Selken. He's a great content creator that has earned his stripes. And just like with everybody else in the YouTube realm, has their right and voice of opinion to state it on a place like YouTube. Someone who's watched his content and appreciates what he does, one thing that gets in the way for me, and bear in mind this is just my observation, is a level of ego and arrogance on his end. As quite clearly he seems to mention a lot of the times how much he's been praised by Hideo Kojima for his work, and seems to kind of rub it in to the viewer and the person who he has discussions with. In all honesty, I congratulate him for his success by having the approval of Kojima-san. Funnily enough, I wasn't going to speak about Python Selken this much, but given on the fact this is a Metal Gear Solid conspiracy video, it seems quite fitting, because the controversy surrounding his theories naturally gathered quite a lot of attention. Whenever you love him or hate him, one can't deny the level of quality of his content. Whilst the body double theory was very correct, I am with the strong belief and stance with many other within the MGS community on the other side of the wall that his speculation was very far-fetched and there's so much to prove and back up the fact that Grey Fox could have never have been Venom Snake. And to prove really why this theory really never had much validity to begin with, then to do that we need to go back to the very beginning to actually question the events behind this controversial theory. And what better place to start guys than Ground Zeroes. <laughs> Bob, there's... It's all right, we got it out. There's another... in my... The events of Ground Zeroes was set within March 1975, during when Big Boss had his operation to rescue both Paz and Chico and would be caught within the secondary blast of the bomb that was contained within Paz's, well, you know what. And given on what we know now, that Big Boss and Venom fell into a temporary coma, at least approximately for nine years. You've been in a coma for quite some time. Yes, yes, I know you would like to know how long. I'm afraid it's been nine. What shuts this theory down evidentially is the fact that during after the events of Ground Zeroes within those nine years, 
Within 1979, Grey Fox was in the Rhodesian Civil War, and it wouldn't be possible for him to be Venom Snake because Venom Snake wouldn't awake until 1984. And within the Metal Gear Solid timeline and lore before the events of Phantom Pain and the game being made, it was confirmed within the lore that Grey Fox, Frank Yeager, was never depicted as being within a coma. To simply put, if Grey Fox was in a coma during 1984, that would completely make the real-world canon events completely void, hence what makes this conspiracy and theory very controversial and just downright outlandish. And in essence, what Pyth and Selkin did was create a time paradox, because given on the timeline, isn't possible for the very fact that he was in a coma because he was awake in 1979 in where he killed Naomi's parents. Snake, what have you done? You changed the future! You've created a time paradox! In all due fairness, before the Phantom Pain came out, one could have easily admit these speculations, because during Outer Heaven, Grey Fox worked alongside Big Boss as one of his best commanders, and then of course again, within Zanzibar land, Wooden couldn't really assume at the time that Venom Snake would actually be the commander of Outer Heaven in Metal Gear 1. That was only a revelation we managed to figure out towards the end of Phantom Pain, as we quite clearly see a tape that Venom Snake puts in the big quarter saying Operation Intrude. And we also see the appearance of the MSX, which happens to have us to believe that of course, Venom Snake is the new big boss in Outer Heaven. There is many wild and interesting theories that Python Selcon raises points on, and some of his videos are backed by a decent amount of evidence, but in terms of Grey Fox, I don't think there's much evidence to point for that theory being a valid one, even at the very beginning. But one thing that was very much more stranger than that is that there was some theory speculating that apparently Venom Snake was Decoy Octopus, which is a more ludicrous theory in terms of really the body double. Although it's a pretty cool conspiracy and speculation considering that Decoy Octopus is a decoy, he's the master of disguise. Before Phantom Pain arrived on our screens, people were definitely grasping straws. I'm sure all most of us can agree is that Decoy Octopus was definitely underused. We saw his appearance within Metal Gear Solid 1, we didn't actually see what he looked like because he was disguising himself as the DARPA chief. A lot of people at the time before Phantom Pain arrived honestly would speculate that it had to be somebody within the Metal Gear Solid franchise who was playing as his third character, Venom Snake. But what makes this theory really an issue is the fact that there isn't much information about Decoy Octopus. Hell, we don't even really know anything about his past. He was definitely one of the most underused characters within Metal Gear Solid 1, and quite frankly it's a shame that Konami and Kojima didn't expand onto his story, because it's an interesting bio that we can see here about his character. Decoy Octopus is described as the master of disguise and Decoy Octopus would alter his appearance and voice to perfectly match that of a subject he was impersonating, going as far to take their blood into his body. In his normal appearance, he lacked ears and possessed a flattened nose. That's really about all we know for what he looks like given on the description. And according to Revolver Ocelot, Octopus was among the old members of Foxhound under Liquid Snake's command. Foxhound was created in 1971, and as we can see, Big Boss is the commander and the founder of the very organization. See, what would have been interesting is that because we don't really know anything about Decoy Octopus, they could have really expanded onto his involvement within Metal Gear Solid, including implementing him inside Metal Gear Solid 5. Hypothetically speaking, they could have expanded onto his story, his lore, and explained why he could have been one of Big Boss's commanders within the early days of Foxhound. Of course, obviously we know that's not the case, because obviously Decoy Octopus died within Shadow Moses. And Venom Snake would die in Metal Gear 1 by Solid Snake blowing him to pieces with a rocket launcher. The reason why people speculated these theories is because, at the time, we just assumed that the real big boss was the one in Outer Heaven, and not Venom. You erased me two times before. Today, will mark the third. Metal Gear Solid 5 has to be one of the most controversial and profound games ever, as there's more questions than there is answers a lot of the time, and buried beneath the lies and the deceit we can actually find the truth. Just like it was the case in Metal Gear Solid 5 when we was uncovering really who was our real identity, and all the signs pointed to the fact that we was never playing as the real big boss, which is super intriguing. This is you as you've lived until this day. Tomorrow, it becomes a phantom. 
Even at the beginning, at the hospital, all signs pointed to the very fact we're not playing as a real Big Boss. And one of the biggest giveaways was definitely the characteristics between Venom and Big Boss. We noticeably see a massive difference, with Venom Snake acting very careless within his hospital escape. And what makes it more interesting is when he makes it outside the hospital and finally meets Ocelot, he doesn't seem to understand or seems confused exactly who Ocelot is. Which is very strange because the real Big Boss would have instantly have known who Ocelot was and would have greeted him. Whilst Hideo Kojima did mislead us quite a lot, he also left us in many clues for us to decipher, which is absolutely brilliant because a lot of the truth was really actually found within the tapes as well as the cutscenes. The name's Ocelot. Big Boss. You know who I am. A certain man gave me a job to do. Two, actually. The first was to get you out of that hospital. The second was to rescue the man himself. You remember? Your partner, nine years ago, Kazuhira Miller. Other signs pointed to as well that Venom Snake was a lot more or less vocal than the likes of Big Boss. He didn't really tend to speak much within the game. And when we rescue Huey in the central base camp, the AI pod with the personality of the boss doesn't seem to recognize Big Boss's presence. And also to mention that Huey himself seems to be quite confused and isn't too sure if that is Big Boss because of how much the appearances are very similar, but they have their slight differences. It's not you, is it? Hey! It's just a machine. Are you? Dr. Emmerich. Snake? And the biggest dead giveaway is when we went to go and recruit Eli and bring him back to base, Ocelot would actually run a DNA test on him to be able to figure out if he was actually related to the character we was playing as, which the DNA results came back and found out that Liquid was not related to Venom Snake, which definitely confirmed we're not playing as Big Boss. Boss, we've got the results of Eli's genetic tests. We can finally put this worry behind us. We used the PCR technique and conducted DNA fingerprinting of the copied DNA sequences. Neither is mainstream science yet, but the concepts and procedures are sound. Both tests say there is 0% chance that the two of you are blood relatives, meaning the results are negative. He's not your son, nor is he your clone. He's just another person. Whoa, whoa. We found out there's an English-speaking soldier somewhere in the region. He's a language specialist. His role is to translate information related to the West into Russian. If we can get him to join us, we'll have the upper hand in information warfare. Find this language specialist and extract him. So, the real big boss can actually speak fluent Russian, unlike Venom Snake who needs to extract the Russian interpreter. Which makes it all the more strange that Kaz definitely knew of Venom Snake's identity earlier on in the game, as if he knows big boss that well, he'd know he would speak Russian. Which just confirms, of course, once again, we're not playing as the real big boss. By the way... Your Russian is superb. Where did you learn to speak it? From my mentor. And within all these telling revelations, it's within Mission 46, the man who sold the world, is only then when we discover our real true identity. With the groundbreaking fact that we was actually playing as the medic who was inside the helicopter during Ground Zeroes removing the bombs from Paz. What's telling about this is that we find that he was actually one of Big Boss's best soldiers. And what makes it so profound is that nobody really could have guessed that we was actually playing as the medic. There's many expendable plot lines within Metal Gear Solid, but really none quite like this one.
journey has been one of speculation, controversies, and the unveiling of a character's intricately woven into the fabric of Metal Gear Solid's universe. The conspiracies of Venom Snake's identity, a phantom hidden in plain sight, leave us with a lingering questions and a deep appreciation for the layers of narrative brilliance that Metal Gear Solid is a timeless and thought-provoking experience. Hideo Kojima, the game's director and creator, has acknowledged that the development process faced challenges, leading to some content being left unfinished or not implemented as originally intended. And even after, eight years later, still leaves us all with phantom pains. Some of you may remember on April 7, 2021, Sony would announce a game called Abandoned. Yes, which would be very fitting for the actual title of the game, considering that this game would become abandoned. It's been a long three years, but if you can cash your mind back on April of 2021, you may recall the internet was a buzz following the announcement of the new horror game that looked awfully like P.T. It was April 7th to be exact, and the new PlayStation blog post had just announced Abandon as a first-person horror survival shooter, set in a highly detailed open-world environment. As per the game's director, Hassan Karaman, developed by Blue Box Game Studios, Abandon was revealed as a PlayStation 5 exclusive, targeting a Q4 2021 release, which also seemed like an optimistic proposition, considering the same post stated that Abandon was set at an early development stage, so no gameplay could be shown. That means Blue Box had around four to six months to go from early development stages to full release. From the get-go, something seemed fishy about the Abandoned, but Abandon's hopeful release window was just the beginning of what would become a whirlwind of controversy, rumors, conspiracy theories, and some good old-fashioned delusional craziness. Shortly after Abandon was announced via the PlayStation website, a Reddit post appeared, suggesting that Abandon and its creator, Hassan Karaman, was actually just a facade for the new Hedi Yokojima game. The connections grew and grew over the course of many months, but the initial post references Karaman and Kojima, sharing the same initials, Blue Box potentially being a Death Stranding easter egg due to the letters BB, and the fact that this is exactly the kind of oddball innocent mischief that Kojima tends to get up to. Back in 2012, Kojima secretly revealed Metal Gear Solid 5 as simply the Phantom Pain, under a new studio known as Moby Dick Studio. The game was supposedly led by Joe Kim Morgren, but fans quickly worked out that the Morgren's first name was an anagram for a Kojima. So when you take into account that Kojima has actually done this before, it's understandable for the fans to speculate that he might be doing it again. But in less than 24 hours after the announcement of Abandoned, a statement was issued via Blue Box's official website, shutting down the theories making connections between Abandoned and Hideo Kojima. To quote Blue Box, we have no association with Hideo Kojima, nor do we claim to have any association, nor was it our intention to claim such a statement. We are a small group of developers working on a passionate title we wanted to work on for a long time." End quote. No, Kojima isn't making the PS5 exclusive abandoned, but might be working with Xbox. A large number of fans continue to speculate on the connection between Abandoned and Hideo Kojima. Then to make things even worse, another now-deleted tweet by Blue Box hinted at the name of Abandoned actually being Silent Hill. The tweet read, in quote, Guess the name Abandoned equals first letter S, last letter L revealing closing in for the unaware Hideo Kojima was working on a new Silent Hill game with movie director Guillermo del Toro years earlier. But the project was cancelled in 2015 after Kojima split ways with publisher Konami. Following month in April 2022, a YouTuber by the name of Dreamcast Guy tweeted that he had spoken with Hassan Karaman in a 30-minute phone call, where the game director revealed to him that the studio is out of money. In a few follow-up responses, Dreamcast Guy said that he believed Abandon was some minor scam that had blown up, and it was basically hightailing off of Kojima and all the conspiracy surrounding Silent Hill PT. At this point, Blue Box Studios and Hassan Karaman had lost all credibility, but the controversy still doesn't stop there. GameSpot sources claims that Karaman created a toxic environment in this chat, even starting a romantic relationship with one individual. He also promised to pay this individual for work on the Abandon's trophy art, but not after until the ribbon you started to come in following the game's release. Karaman also asked another member of this secret group chat to locate storage space in the US for him to avoid having to fly from the Netherlands and do it himself. He promised to pay the individual, but later rescinded the deal. Both PlayStation and Karaman refused to comment on the report from GameSpot, 
and it's been pretty silent ever since. Word of this mess even reached Kojima, who in November of 2022 called the whole thing, in quote, a nuisance. It was an image that was circulated by controversy that sparked even more rumors, that had fans theorizing that the blurry eye patch model could be Big Boss or Solid as Snake, the Kojima-led series. So, was Abandoned really a big scam? One thing we know for certain that the title is fitting because the game is now abandoned, but of course there's no doubt that this very company was hightailing off the conspiracy and the great masterful work of Hideo Kojima by leaving subtle references in that would promote their very game. This conspiracy is just one among many within the Metal Gear Solid archives of conspiracy theories. Kept you waiting, huh? Don't you die on me, damn it! Bibi's robbing! Intubate, now! Cardiac arrest is in BFIP! What if the entire events of Metal Gear Solid 5 takes place in Big Boss's coma? So what is the big conspiracy? In the MGS lore, Big Boss potentially endures three comas. One during the LET project in 1972, although some think this is a mistranslation from a Japanese game manual. Another during the events of MGS5 in 1975 to 1984, and from 1999 to 2014, after he is defeated during the events of Metal Gear 2 at the hands of his son, Solid Snake. Kojima was asked to clarify this absurd trio of comas during a Game Informer interview. In quotation, Kojima says, there are only once he is in a coma, and to explain that, you need to play towards the ends of Phantom Pain, there it will come together, end quote. Kojima answered critically, it isn't clear whether Kojima means Snake suffers one coma in MGS5 or during his life, but the Game Informer article does state that Kojima recognizes the series, while complexity and might reconsider rewriting elements for better continuity. How many comas was he in, or you know, was this two separate incidents uh, that he was you know asleep and they started this? No, well, there's uh, only once uh, he's in a coma. And well, to explain that, uh, you'll need to play towards the end of the Phantom Pain. It will all come together. You'll be like, oh, that's what happened. What if Big Boss only suffers one coma, and the events of MGS5 take place within his unconscious state? So does it make sense? A coma is a wonderful device for skipping between time periods and diverse geography. Almost a natural hub for missions, MGS5's hub is Mother Base but it could be a physical manifestation of Snake's mid-coma psyche. The theory is, is that Big Boss is unconscious as someone likely Major Zero and the Patriots attempted to code his life, and use it to create an AI soldier program like the S3 plan in MGS2. Originally thought to be the Solid Snake simulation, but actually the Patriots selection for societal sanity. It would also fit into Kojima's theme of revenge and how the enemy is passed between generations. A lot of theories speculate around the idea of this being somewhat of a dream sequence within Big Boss's subconscious. But of course this theory would hold no validity in the end. As Kojima stated, we just have to wait and see, which evidently pointed to the fact that Big Boss did fall within two comas and that he awoke just before Venom Snake and made his escape out of the hospital. Boss, how are you back on your feet so quickly? <laughs> There's a non-smoking ward. Boss, if I listened to everything the doctors said, I'd probably die in here. No point waking up after nine years for that. Well, having you out of that bed makes things a little easier. Bad news, huh? Hmm. Things are looking worse. Go on. They found out about you waking up. And the man on fire picked this time to wake up, too. We'll have to move forward ahead of schedule. It's not just him. We'll be putting the people in this hospital in the line of fire. They'll be your shield and necessary diversion to buy us some time. And you? I'll be right by his side. Can you keep it up? It's a hell of a lie. And we know this given on the hospital escape within the ambulance. The initial first hospital escape was somewhat of a lie. It was shrouded with confusion. And the very fact that all the events that we see there might have not clearly happened. As we put together the timeline sequences and dates, it is confirmed that Big Boss did get rescued by Ocelot just a few hours before Venom Snake did. Before the very mission, the man who sold the world, which revealed the true truth of what happened in that hospital and within the ambulance sequence, we can actually see the time zones which all clarifies exactly all what happened. This way, boss. Hurry.
Use that bike. It's tuned up and ready to go. One of the next groundbreaking theories is the idea that Big Boss was never Ishmael. That in fact Ishmael was actually a conception within Venom Snake's broken mind, constructed through experiences and expectations, and given on the fact that he suffers severe hallucinations, it's a very good argument to put to the table, alongside the evidence that suggests that Big Boss can't possibly be Ishmael. When we see when he fights Quiet, he doesn't use any forms of CQC, and in fact becomes overwhelmed, and when he's hit with the knife, we don't see no bleeding. The one thing that makes this seem very bizarre is all the inconsistency within Ishmael and the escape within the hospital. The random disappearances, the reappearances. In a sense, it is almost like Venom Snake is talking to his self, his own subconscious that is projecting onto the real world. Who are you? Who am I? You're talking to yourself. There's a very good theory that is actually most likely the case is the fact that due to the fur boy's appearance bit at the hospital, Psycho Mantis, which could be one of the reasons why Venom Snake sees things that appear to not be there. Venom Snake's lust for revenge must have been so powerful that it attracted the attention of Psycho Mantis, which no doubt has the abilities to make these kind of hallucinations possible. Plane's position was directly north of the hospital where you'd been asleep for nine years. And this anomaly was reported at exactly the same time that you woke up. The plane was enveloped in flame from the inside out. The fuselage burnt to ashes. There were no survivors, at least not publicly admitted. Your thoughts formed a synchronicity with the boy's psyche and were amplified inside his brain. That would have been more than enough to trigger his abilities. Psycho Mantis has changed his allegiances more times than we can count. Based on going on really who has the most burning revenge at the time, such as the man on fire, but there's no doubt that he would assist Venom Snake escape in the hospital considering all the chaos he caused distracting XOF. A lot of the times we can keep forgetting that Psycho Mantis has a bigger involvement, it seems like he can go unnoticed. But the facts are, he is the puppeteer controlling the puppets in his own little show. And it's almost like a demon that possesses and watches over Snake and everybody else who is tied in with this big lust for revenge. So what about Ishmael? How do we know that he's just constructed within Venom Snake's mind? If we look here at this particular scene, we can see that Ishmael went inside that other room. But for some reason, when Venom Snake looks in front, we can see Ishmael clearly stood there in the crowd. Almost like he just teleported directly in front. Plus it's worth bringing to your attention as well that this mod on Nexus Mods is actually a mod that actually changes Ishmael into Big Boss. Now one could argue that the very Ishmael that was stood in front where all the people get shot is actually just a reused asset of Ishmael, but this mod clearly disproves their argument, because within the game coding and the textures, it changes it into Big Boss, which kind of cements the fact that really Venom Snake could be seeing things, and that really he is teleporting from place to place because he's a conception within his mind. We could clearly see Ishmael get shot here and die, which tells you everything you need to know when he appears again and grabs Venom back in the door. So does this theory prove that Ishmael isn't real? Because as you've just seen there with the character models, it was clearly Ishmael. And of course he dies. So how could he possibly be in two places at once at the same time after being killed? It just doesn't add up. And the mod just proves that point by the very fact that that character was actually meant to be Ishmael as we can see it change into Big Boss when we actually apply the modification. If we see here, we can see Ishmael jumping off of the stairs. Then he appears to vanish. We don't hear no sound of impact when he lands. Plus we notice the XOF guard check with his spotlight and torch 
and seems to be confused that nobody is there. To them we come to a cutscene where we see Ishmael outside. How could he get outside so quick when there were guards surrounding the entrance? And what's clearly noticeable is that we can actually notice that Psychomantis is very present within this moment, during the times where it seems like Ishmael is around. There is no doubt and the highest possibilities that thanks to Psychomantis is the very reason behind Venom Snake's escape and the explanations behind this hallucination which is Ishmael, the supposed big boss in disguise. So now the question still remains, well if that's the case and if Ishmael's not real, then how the hell is he driving the ambulance, when we can clearly see that Venom Snake is within the passenger seat? Well, that brings me on to the movie that I think that some of you may have seen, and if you haven't, I suggest you go watch it, and that movie in question is Fight Club. The story follows an unnamed protagonist referred to as the narrator, who is discontent with his consumer-driven life and suffers from insomnia. He attends support groups for various ailments to cure his insomnia. Though shared emotional experiences, during a business trip, he meets a soap salesman named Tyler Durden, as the two form an unconventional friendship. As the story unfolds, it becomes clear that the narrator and Tyler Durden are two sides of the same personality. The narrator suffering from a dissociative identity disorder. Well, who comes to mind when we think of such disorder? Of course, Venom Snake. This disorder created the charismatic anarchist Tyler as a manifestation of his repressed desires and frustrations. The twist is that the narrator and Tyler are not separate individuals, but rather different facets of the same person. What's interesting within the movie is that his alter ego is driving the vehicle. Just like that with Venom Snake, Ishmael is driving the vehicle. But Tyler Durden doesn't exist, it's just a concept made within his own mind. Because in reality, it's actually the narrator who is actually driving the vehicle himself, but his alter ego is the one who's taking the wheel. Which could be a massive possibility for the fact that Venom Snake was really piloting the vehicle, and Big Boss had escaped a long time ago out of the hospital. It wouldn't make sense that Big Boss would be in the hospital in the line of fire. It would make all the effort of what Zero did to try and protect Big Boss completely pointless. After all, Venom Snake is to take the stage of the new Big Boss and inevitably taking cover whilst Big Boss hides out and builds his own outer heaven. Um, well, all right. I find that I'm a, a person who um, can um, take on the guises of, of different people that I meet. I can switch accents in, in seconds of meeting somebody and I can adopt their accent. I've always found that I collect. I'm a collector. Um, and I've always just seemed to collect personalities. Hideo Kojima has expressed admiration for David Bowie and has cited him as an influence on the character design and themes in Metal Gear Solid V. The use of the man who sold the world in the game is particularly noteworthy as it adds to the layer of symbolism to the very narrative that relates to Venom Snake. What is interesting about the man who sold the world is the song is often seen as exploring themes of identity, self-discovery, and the search for one's true self. The lyrics suggest a meeting between two individuals one who underwent a significant change, perhaps a personal transformation or realization, and another who didn't recognize the transformed person, hence the reference to selling the world. The phrase coined as the man who sold the world can be seen as a metaphor for selling out, losing one's true identity or undergoing a profound change that others may not recognize. The song's introspective and somewhat surreal lyrics leave room for personal interpretation and listeners may derive different meanings based on their own experience and perspectives. In the context of Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain, where the song is prominently featured, its themes of identity and transformation and the consequences of change align with the game's narrative, particularly the twists and revelations related to Venom Snake's identity 
and the use of this song in the game adds to an emotional and thematic layer of storytelling. There are many interpretations of the relationship between Venom Snake, Big Boss, and Skullface in MGS5. One interpretation is that Skullface is a reflection of Venom Snake, rather than Big Boss. Both Venom and Skullface are catastrophic products of the kind of war games the likes of Zero and Big Boss perpetuate. Venom Snake and Skullface faces are both faceless entities, assisting Big Boss from behind the scenes in the past. Venom, like Skullface, is parasited by words from foreign sources. Venom has been brainwashed to act as the new Big Boss and speak words they made me speak. Venom's continuous suggestion continues as despite being Big Boss, he is constantly influenced to act on the orders given by the likes of Kaz and Ocelot. Venom, like Skullface, has known loss, but not the loss of Motherbase, the loss of himself and his identity. What many people have been asking that confuses them in Metal Gear Solid 5 is why does it seem like Venom Snake's identity is transformating into Skullface? And it's kind of metaphorical as we can see that he is walking within the footsteps of the very man himself. And the very similarities between Big Boss, Venom and Skullface are really all not that far from each other. You too have known loss. And that loss torments you still. You hope hatred might someday replace the pain. But it never goes away. It makes a man hideous inside and out. Wouldn't you agree? Skullface is a very man that is also like Venom Snake, both of which have lost their identities. They share the similar path in which they walk. Hence why we can see him almost like there as a phantom himself. It's a broad representation of exactly how these two people are almost like the same side of the coin. They are, in a sense, one in the same. I've known you since your time at Langley. I've long been the other side of your coin. The Phantom Pain spends a lot of time touching upon the loss of identity, more broadly focusing on the loss of cultural and ethnic identity. Skullface is a direct victim of this, and this is symbolized by his lack of face. Venom 2 is faceless, the one of design for him has been stolen from him, and therefore he carries out his duties willingly, almost standing within the very shoes of the very man that he's taking down, almost like they share similarities. Skullface, Venom, Big Boss, they're all one in the same. They are all plagued by their own demons. This pain is ours, and no one else's. The secret weapon we wield, out of sight. We will be stronger than ever for our peace. Sahalanthropus will unleash that thirst unto the future. Those were his last words. Cause. What makes for an interesting theory is that some people believe that Big Boss is actually Skullface. Skullface represents the hatred Big Boss holds in his heart. Skullface is Big Boss's revenge on the world in an attempt to destroy Cypher because of the events of Peace Walker. Kaz's betrayal is why Big Boss would have also have destroyed Mother Base. By utilizing the language parasites, he plans to stop Zero from being able to control humanity using the Patriots. By destroying their language, he destroys the code Zero uses to control. What is most unusual about this theory that kind of makes it eerie and very spooky is that Skullface actually references the same lines that Big Boss says to Chico in Peace Walker. Almost like if he is talking as if he has heard these words from Big Boss himself, whilst it couldn't be possible given on the fact that Skullface wasn't present within Peace Walker. But the question is, what if Big Boss is Skullface? Hence why Skullface says those exact words to Chico himself. Chico, growing up means choosing how you're gonna live your life. Chico, growing up means choosing how you're going to live your life. Just one time, I was questioned by this other guy. He was different from the rest. I'll never forget him, what he said. Cut right into me. Nothing to be ashamed of. Pain gets the better of us all. Let the words comfort you. Now, what did your boss tell you? 
nothing to be ashamed of. Pain gets the better of us all. <laughs> The one thing that both Skullface and Big Boss have in common is they both share the great deal of animosity towards the likes of Zero, and they both have the same objectives in order to wish to destroy Cypher. Hence why some people believe that Skullface is an alter ego to Big Boss, his evil side. Skullface is a representation of Big Boss's descent into evil. After losing his mind with all the PTSD and all the troubles he has faced, and extracting revenge against Cypher, by using this alter ego, which is Skullface. That doesn't surprise me. You're in a mild state of shock from all the pain and exhaustion you're going through. Maybe one day you'll learn to stop hiding yourself. With me? I know how you feel, Snake. I'm a spy too. You don't realize it, but the fake you is eating away at the real you. The person you're pretending to be is becoming the person you are and the real you is screaming out from somewhere deep inside. It's quite evidently noticeable within Ground Zeroes, which is a POW camp to extract information out of soldiers, that Big Boss himself would wish to extract such information out the likes of Paz, who knew the location of Zero. In a sense, he is the one who is interrogating all these people at Camp Omega, which explains the possibilities why these POWs know the exact words that were spoken by Big Boss to Chico in Peace Walker, which wouldn't be possible unless Skullface was actually working behind the scenes still to keep an eye on Big Boss and was listening in and recording what he had said, hence repeating the same phrases that Big Boss uses. There's a high possibility and a chance, just like the movie Fight Club, that the very character that we know as the narrator, who has an alter ego called Tyler Durden, who switches back to himself, then back into Tyler Durden, there's a big possibility that Big Boss keeps switching between his good side and his evil side, which points to the possibility of Big Boss having a great deal of dissociative identity disorder, switching between different personalities and not remembering what he has done on his previous personality. Just like in the movie Fight Club, we know that the main protagonist hasn't remembered anything that his alter ego, Tyler Durden, has done, as he is conflicted with his dissociative identity disorder between his rights and his wrongs, but can't seem to have no recollection of the reason for why everybody treats him a certain way, because he has no idea of the actions that his alter ego has committed. It is a separation of oneself through a personality that he has created, because for example within the movie, his alter ego Tyler Durden has placed bombs around different buildings in which he is trying to destroy, but when he switches back to his original self, he doesn't agree with the actions of what this Tyler Durden character is doing and goes out of his way to try and dismantle all the bombs from blowing the building. There's a great deal of possibility within this theory that Big Boss is conflicted with identities, hence why within Ground Zeroes, Chico seems very confused when Big Boss seems to come to his rescue. Considering that if that is the case, Chico must have been interrogated by Big Boss himself, hence why he doesn't want to have anything to do with the likes of Big Boss and seems scared that Big Boss has come to rescue him. Which met that very moment seem very unusual, considering that if someone's coming to rescue you, you'd be more than happy to escape. It's almost like the events of Ground Zeroes didn't happen the way that we thought it did. At least the way we were told that it happened. That's one theory that I'm going to come to next. Chico, it's me. No! No! Go away! Go away! Get off, man! Move me out of here, please! Get off me! Get off! Chico, keep it down! Go away! So this is a mind-boggling theory that I think you've probably heard of before. And it's one that goes really deep and down the rabbit hole that ties in with the old VR virtual reality from the Metal Gear games. Of course, Metal Gear Solid 5 being the foundation for virtual reality. Some speculate and theorize that Ground Zeroes is actually a VR simulation that Venom Snake is undergoing in his coma. During the time that he would take the personality through hypnosis, and different means for him to become Big Boss. So the events that we see in Ground Zeroes are not actually really what took place. Whilst the events of Ground Zeroes did happen, the theory speculates that this is just a virtual reality, cobbled up through expectations within Venom Snake's mind to train him to become Big Boss. Venom Snake's memories of Ground Zeroes are different, to hide his identity as the medic and to deal with his guilt of not saving Paz. 
We see flashbacks during the Phantom Pain, and they are a lot different from the Ground Zero's mission that we all remember. Just like how Raiden's version of the tanker was different when he replayed the mission that Snake underwent during the tanker, which was a real event, but through VR wasn't actually a real recreation of what actually Solid Snake experienced. But instead, the tanker mission we played as the player was actually all virtual reality. I've gone through VR training of the tanker mission before. Yeah, well, I doubt it accurately simulates the events of that mission. When we look at these theories to these controversies, we try to find evidence. The footage that plays is of Raiden's version of the mission, as we can see here. In the footage and the picture I've taken and the flashbacks, we see that Snake is holding an assault rifle. The real Snake wouldn't bring an assault rifle to this mission, and we know that the Patriots tried to ruin Snake's reputation and label him as a terrorist. So in Raiden's version, it would make sense that Snake has an assault rifle and is getting into shootouts for people. The Patriots were trying to make him seem like a terrorist and make it look like he was the one who sabotaged the tanker. In the tanker mission we played, Ocelot sealed the door to the hold after Snake went through, meaning he was locked in. But Ocelot doesn't exist in Raiden's version. In Raiden's version, the betrayal part never happened, and Metal Gear Ray was not on board. Because Raiden doesn't know anything about Ray when Snake mentions Ocelot being on the tanker. Raiden asks him, in quote, Who are you talking about? Yeah, and him. Who are you talking about? A man that was supposed to be dead. Their target was also Metal Gear Ray. But Ocelot eliminated Colonel Gerlukovich and Marine Commander Scott Dolph, and he hijacked Ray. Raiden also met Ocelot a few times earlier, but didn't recognize him as someone who was on the tanker. It means that Ocelot was not in Raiden's VR mission, who would try to cover up Ocelot's involvement in the tanker mission, maybe the Patriots, as he was working as one of their spies. Everything that Snake describes about the tanker mission after President Johnson got shot is exactly the way it was played when we were in it. In the plant mission, we are playing as Raiden, so the footage we're seeing are his memories of VR training. The footage that doesn't line up with the tanker mission occurs at the same time as when Otacon starts talking about how the Patriots used Snake and him as bait and framed him, then running a smear campaign. It's impossible that the version we played is the same one that Raiden did. There are too many logical contradictions, all of which I'm sure you guys could add to the speculation as well. Because with Raiden being an unknown pawn of the Patriots, would only see the things in that VR mission that the Patriots wanted him to see, to brand Solid Snake as the villain. And for the very facts too, that Raiden doesn't know who Otacon is. And if he actually saw the events that took place within the tanker, he obviously would have known. Metal Gear Solid 2 could massively relate to the likes of Metal Gear Solid 5. For all we know, that Ground Zeroes is the truth that the Patriots wish us to see, perhaps through the eyes of Venom Snake, who is undergoing this simulation. They didn't choose Snake to be a hero, so they decided to do a smear campaign. I think the Patriots wanted to make an example of him so everybody would think twice before opposing them. That's it! They set all this up just to nail you guys! They followed this up with a perfect plan. They immediately sent a fully loaded tanker to the same location and sank it, then set up the facility to camouflage the development of Arsenal gear. And we fell for it. Two more puppets in their show. Because a lot of the events circulating Ground Zeroes seem to be quite uncertain and inconclusive at times. We know Venom Snake was brainwashed by Ocelot, and he relived Naked Snake's missions during his coma. His altered state of consciousness has helped us implant powerful suggestions through induced hypnagogia. He's experienced all your missions on record and shares all your knowledge and experience. It's very most likely considering that this hospital was ran by the Patriots, that this was also the very first place where they tested to make the Ultimate Soldier, just like the Solid Snake simulation to try recreate the Ultimate Soldier. In essence, Venom Snake was a pawn of Zero's plan. He was a part of Cypher unknowingly, doing the bidding of ultimately eliminating Skullface and taking out XOF, which was a threat to the likes of the organization we know as the Patriots which is evidently clear with the involvement of Cypher and Zero, as we know Mother Base and a lot of what was funded to make Mother Base run was all thanks to Cypher's involvement. From what we know when we look back in Metal Gear Solid 5 at the very ending is that Venom Snake starts to remember his true identity, and with that, some of the real events that actually took place within Ground Zeroes. If we put both clips together, we can see there is quite a change, which evidently shows that what we saw in Ground Zeroes to begin with might not have been the truth.
It's okay. The other bomb, we managed it. In Ground Zeroes, when the helicopter crashes, we get a different take. We assume that the second bomb explodes, and then we crash into a helicopter. But when Venom Snake recollects his memories, it seems like the second bomb explodes, and we don't see the appearance of the helicopter. And on the third scene, we can see that Venom Snake is looking back, and remembers that the helicopter was actually shot down by one of the XOF soldiers that was actually on the helicopter. And there actually was no second bomb as they removed it. So this theory disproves the point that we really don't know what the truth is, and all we can do is interpret through our own decision making what really happened on the events during Ground Zeroes. Can we take what Venom Snake saw as being fact when we know throughout the majority of the game what he sees is potentially hallucinations and his dissociative identity disorder crisis which makes people believe that somehow Venom Snake is Big Boss and in reality it's just another one of his personalities alongside Skullface. That in fact both Big Boss and Venom Snake and Skullface are all one in the same. At least metaphorically speaking and not actually being three different separate characters but instead just being projections. So it always seems that we seem to be coming back to be asking the same questions that we can't figure out within so many contradictions in Metal Gear Solid's story. It seems like Chico is afraid of Big Boss for one reason we can't understand. Is it because he knew that Big Boss's arrival would be the death of Paz? Or is it because of the fact that he knew that he sold Big Boss out and betrayed him, hence why he was worried that he'd die? Or is it because of the very fact that Big Boss is Skullface, and for the very fact that we can't see him in visual terms, how do we not know that secretly behind the visage is the very man who's got this identity crisis, who is playing the very part of Skullface? The questions still remain unanswered and for you to decide. So do we take what we see at face value as being true? Or even within the contradictions, do we still continue to believe in these very theories that we all come up with? How's it feel to play the traitor? No more war games. You're a real man now, soldier. If one thing is for certain, making this video has given me a mild form of schizophrenia, and I myself feel like I've associated myself with the dissociative identity disorder along the way. All thanks to Kojima's ambiguous and mind-boggling stories that have us all asking these kinds of questions. Which within no doubt was probably intended for a good reason to keep us all interested and in coming back to the story of Metal Gear Solid. All of you are aware of the brilliance of Hideo Kojima's work on how it is that he has us interpreting different scenes within the whole entire franchise. But the very fact that this is all intended and done intentionally to throw us off from what the truth may be. That in very fact, what he has us doing is discussing amongst each other all these different theories and ideas, which is all obviously intentional to still make this game as relevant as it is today. Because deep within the lies, somewhere there is buried truth. And when we uncover it, we still find ourselves asking more questions and without any answers. In a sense, we are like cars. We're being played like a damn fiddle. And Metal Gear Solid 5 is a perfect representation of us the player. We are Venom Snake. We are Big Boss. In fact, we're living on through them, continuing their meme. We're trying to figure out our identity, what it is that drives us to move forward to do the right thing. We as the viewer are the dissociative ones. We're dissociative from the reality, from the very truth, that we can't seem to understand. And in within the excellence of Metal Gear Solid's franchise, Kojima always never stops misleading us. It looks to be a kind of dissociative disorder. Dissociative amnesia, where memories are blocked out to protect the mind. And dissociative identity disorder, where whole personality changes. What we're seeing seems to be a combination of the two. She truly believes she's nothing more than a student living in 1974. Peace Day was a lot of fun. I hope we can do it again. She doesn't respond to anything that conflicts with her internal timeline. Metal Gear Solid 5 certainly makes us question what is real and what is not real, especially at the very ending on the side offs with Paz. As we can clearly tell that Paz Ortega it shouldn't be alive. She died in Ground Zero. She was clearly killed by the blast. Her appearances are hallucinations experienced by Venom Snake, the player. The revelation comes as part of the game's intricate and layered narrative. Ocelot and Kaz's appearance doesn't make sense neither. How could they be possibly be present within this moment if Paz doesn't exist? 
This just clearly demonstrates the severity of Venom Snake's broken mind, for the very fact that he's even seeing people that are in his own unit that are currently alive as physical, moving, talking manifestations. His guilt, his trauma, the hallucinations involving Snake are all internal struggles and serve as a method to create confusion and internal conflict with the protagonist. The themes of Metal Gear Solid 5 as race and revenge, it goes a lot deeper with deception and manipulation and the psychological toll of warfare that affects us as the player and also Venom Snake. The side ops of Paz are a perfect confirmation for why such theories and speculations come to light, making the likes of Metal Gear Ground Zeroes and Phantom Pain one of the most profound and controversial games within the franchise. So whatever the theories are that you believe, it's really hard to pinpoint exactly what is the truth? to remember than hatred and rage. But of course, this is you thinking that I should think that. It is no mystery now. I am just a phantom, a fragment of the mind you have lost. The real me died a long time ago. Brother, it's been too long. It's been a while, brother. Who are you? You know who I am. Liquid? Not so young anymore, eh, Snake? By far one of the most interesting theories behind Liquid Ocelot, which is some to believe that he is possessed by Liquid's arm, some people reckon that he's putting on the whole facade, and most interestingly of all within the theories is that because his father was a spiritual medium who could speak to the living from the dead, and vice versa, that he has a way to be able to tap into his father's abilities to speak to people beyond the grave. The Sorrow is portrayed as a spirit medium and a psychic, and he is the father of Revolver Ocelot. During the game, protagonist Naked Snake Big Boss encounters a Sorrow in a surreal and otherworldly riverbank environment. The Sorrow's abilities allow him to channel spirits of the dead, and the player must navigate this haunting sequence filled with ghosts of enemies Snake has killed throughout the game. The encounter with Sorrow serves as a reflection on the consequences of player's actions, emphasizing the impact of choices and the cycle of violence. There's a lot of credibility to this theory, because if Ocelot's father is like a spirit medium, there's more than a high possibility of Ocelot sharing the same psychic abilities as his own father. So we know after Liquid died in Metal Gear Solid 1 that they recovered Liquid's arm, and of which then they would have a French doctor apply this new arm onto Ocelot, which makes perfect sense considering Grey Fox actually chopped Ocelot's hand completely off. It's happening again. This damn right arm. Liquid! It's almost as if it's having its revenge. How much do you think we spent on that arm in Lyon? The best transplant surgery team in the world. I never trust a Frenchman. A lot of the sources tell us that Ocelot is actually using a form of hypnotherapy on himself or a form of self-hypnosis. Some of you might recall that during Metal Gear Solid 5, Ocelot would use such techniques against the likes of himself to convince himself that the real big boss was actually Venom Snake. I believe that he's the real big boss. I'll have no conscious knowledge of you. Where's the lie in that? Self-hypnosis. It's nothing new in my line of work. Manipulating memories. The past. 
And with the self-hypnosis is also the implanted nanomachines, which feeds his psyche to act more like Liquid Snake, in a sense, adopt his persona all that much more. But it's very credible to think that he could be a spirit medium who's contacting Liquid beyond the dead. And the reason why Liquid's arm comes into play is because it's a connection between Ocelot and Liquid himself, a living part of him that he can still channel his energy, his spirit through, in order to get in possession of Ocelot. For any of you that are up on spirituality and ghostly things, know that sometimes that spirits are tied to certain objects, people even, even extensions of themselves, such as the remains of their bodies that have been buried in the ground, hence why people report supernatural paranormal activity around grave sites. It's more than likely that Liquid's arm is a spiritual connection beyond the grave that allows him to possess Ocelot. Hence why we know that in Metal Gear Solid 4 that he removes the arm and actually gets a new prosthetic in exchange. We know throughout Metal Gear Solid 2 that Liquid is definitely present, as we can hear the notorious English accent. In Metal Gear Solid 4, it doesn't seem like Liquid Snake is present. Of course, because Ocelot has removed the arm, which is the very extension that he uses to connect to Liquid beyond the dead. Hence why we don't actually hear any vocal changes with an Ocelot's voice during Metal Gear Solid 4. Through different testimonies of those who've experienced paranormal activity, have talked about that certain items and objects that they have in their house carries a great deal of possession. And once they've removed these objects from the presence of their home, no longer does the supernatural activity continue. It seems like in Metal Gear Solid 2 that Ocelot and Liquid had come to some sort of understanding. They both wanted to share the same goals, and Ocelot was the perfect body vessel to carry out Liquid's plans, to carry out Liquid's revenge against Cypher and the Patriots. We know that Ocelot had the same goals in mind in wanting to destroy the Patriots and to make Big Boss awake from his coma. His goals all along was to really aid us within our mission, and by taking on Liquid's persona was a great way to fool the Patriot system. Even though we didn't see any vocal changes in Metal Gear Solid 4 to point to the fact that it could be Liquid, one thing is for certain that it seems like Ocelot had definitely adopted the personality nonetheless. So whatever side of the story you wish to believe, well that's entirely up to you. But one can't deny the spiritual medium theory that is very interesting and is actually backed up by quite a few interesting pieces of evidence to show that's why Ocelot really is in contact with Liquid Snake. The concept of transplanted limbs and the transfer of consciousness is part of a series exploration of advanced technology, genetics, and the consequences of war. The relationship between Liquid Snake and Ocelot is one of the many intricate elements that contribute to the narrative complexity of Metal Gear Solid series. And without any doubts, one of the most fascinating parts within Metal Gear Solid's storyline. I am Liquid's doppelganger. The interesting part about this moment before we say farewell to Ocelot is it appears like something leaves his body because as when Ocelot dies, we see him react viciously as if something is coming out of his body, perhaps Liquid's very soul. We know that Hideo Kojima likes to leave small little details within Metal Gear Solid games and sometimes they go massively overlooked. This is potentially one of those moments. As we wrap up this journey through the realm of Metal Gear Solid, fan theories and conspiracies, we find ourselves immersed in a world where the lines between truth and illusion, fact and speculation, are as blurred as the enigmatic storytelling within the games themselves. The passion and creativity of Metal Gear Solid's community have given rise to tapestry of theories that span the entire series, weaving intricate connections, hidden meanings, and unforeseen twists. As we peel back the layers of these conspiracy, it becomes evident that Hideo Kojima's masterpiece is not just a series of games, but a canvas onto which fans project their own interpretations and reflections. Theories surrounding Venom Snake's identity, the mysteries of Cypher, and the philosophical depth of the Patriots only scratch the surface of the vast narratives landscape that Metal Gear Solid has become. Whenever you're a seasoned veteran of the series or a newcomer intrigued by the web of intrigue, one thing is certain, 
Metal Gear Solid has left an incredible mark on the gaming world, transcending the boundaries of traditional storytelling. As we sign off, remember that in the world of Metal Gear, nothing is as it seems, and the journey is often more meaningful than the destination. Keep theorizing, keep speculating, and most importantly, keep playing. Until next time, this is The Voice Box signing off from the captivating universe of Metal Gear Solid. Stay vigilant, stay curious, and may your codec conversations be ever enlightening. And thank you once again to all my subscribers who supported me through my journey. Until we meet again.